Okay, well, like I said, we may have to do some fiddling here. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is just invite, first of all, us to become mindful. It's really easy. And so what I, what I call this is quiet time. So the practice is, as I named it, is just stopping and dropping. So for the next few minutes, what we'll uh, suggest, and everything is optional. There's nothing here that anybody has to do. If it feels uncomfortable or if something doesn't sound right, just put it aside. But it, you know, it has to be, it has to be comfortable. So what I'm gonna, but in the interest of the workshop and being able to have <clears throat> an experience that you can take away that's practical and usable, then the more that we participate in the exercises, the more that we have that, op that op opportunity of taking something away. Oh yeah, that, that'll ring true maybe two weeks from now. So, but it's always your choice. So right now I just like us to consider having some quiet time. And if you feel comfortable with just closing your eyes, and if you don't, that's fine. The mind always wants to have something to do. So what we do is we give it something to do. And right now, we're going to give it sounds. We're just going to say, I'd like to pay attention to the sounds in the room. And as best we can, we just let the sounds come to us. As best we can. Just let them come and they go. The beautiful thing about sounds is they're always in the present moment. So that helps to bring us back home. It helps to ground us. And it's also helpful to rebalance the nervous system by breathing down into the belly. So we can just become aware of the sounds and just invite the breath to be deep. May my breath be deep. May I breathe deeply. And what this does, this resets the parasympathetic nervous system. Now it takes about 20 minutes for that to fully happen, but every little bit that we do helps throughout the day. So just to stop and drop, just notice the sounds without thinking about, oh, that's a fan over there in the corner. We just notice the sound, let it come to us, invite the breath down into the belly. And then next we're going to shift our attention. Our attention has been on sound. We're going to invite the attention to become aware of the sensations in the body, especially the sensations of posture. Just knowing where the feet are, and maybe curling the toes a little bit. Feet are a wonderful place to ground, they're safe sensations to use. <coughs> and then shifting the attention maybe to the hands, just feeling the hands, and again, maybe just curling the fingers a little bit, just to help to direct the attention to a safe place in our body. And then the third place that we could invite is the tongue. The toes and fingers and the tongue have a lot of nerve endings. And these nerve endings work in our favor because they help to guide the brain, help to release some of the stress and the anxiety that we're experiencing by giving it a different place to go. And so then you can play with that. You can just, on one in-breath, you can become aware of the feet, maybe curl the toes a little bit. On the next in-breath, just become aware of the fingers, knowing where the hands are. Maybe on the next breath, 
Just noticing the tongue, where the tongue is in the mouth, feeling the teeth. So this is something that I call just quiet time. Uh, we probably are spending maybe two or three minutes doing this, but it's very significant. If we do this on a regular basis, it really helps by the end of the day. We're not nearly as worn out and as fatigued. And it's just the, the, the deal of remembering, oh, okay, I should just have a little bit of quiet time. This is a very helpful, simple, and practical way to get grounded, just to stop and drop, come back into the present moment, there will always be lots of work and other things to do afterwards, but right now we just stop and drop. This is our quiet time. So we'll end the exercise now, and I'll continue on with the presentation. And hopefully this guy will work. Can we ask you questions throughout the presentation? Yeah, you can, yeah. Now, we've got a whole bunch of material that we can <coughs> look at and I'll be explaining that. Um, but I, I think it's best that we, if we don't get everything covered, we don't get it covered. I think it's more important that we get our questions answered. You know, that, we, that, that to be the takeaway that, oh, um, yeah, I, now I understand what, what that means or, or whatever. I think it's more important than just uh, <laughs> getting this doggone thing to work. <laughs> okay, here we go. So. Today, what the focus is for today, is we're going to look at mindfulness. Mindfulness has been around for thousands of years. So it's not that it's something new. Uh, it's just kind of been kind of realized. And the nice part about mindfulness is we all have it. It's not anything that we have to go um, out and purchase. So what we're going to do today in the workshop, we're going to look at grounding. And that's what we were doing. We are just doing some exercises in grounding. What you did there, you were grounding yourselves in the present moment. I don't know if you've heard of them talking about the present moment. It used to kind of intrigue me. What is this present moment thing yet? Anyway, well, that's what we were doing. We're just being present in a safe way. So the second part of the, of the workshop will be on reflecting. So what, we're, what we did today, just now, that was to, re, to release some of the anxiety that's, that's happening that we come into the room with. But what about a week from now? What about when I have to go and do something two weeks from now? And it's the same thing. So that's where we are going to use a second exercise to reflect on that. So when that event comes up, that it will be different for us. Rather than reacting to that event, we'll be able to respond more. So those are the two pieces that I'd like to cover. And if we don't get them done, we'll Maybe you have to come back again. <laughs> so this is what grounding means. Grounding is just this. This little guy here, what he's done, and this is what we just did, is we just moved our thoughts. We have thoughts and emotions. And if we don't give them a place to go, what they'll do, they'll just build and build. So that's grounding right there. That's really an important slide. <coughs> We just keep that slide in mind. That's really the deal. We just ground, you stop and drop. And then the <coughs> next one, this is reflection. So now I'll start to explain that mindfulness has three qualities to it. It has attention, intention, and reflection. Probably 80% of our work is here in the attention part of it. Intention, that's where when I said, may my breath be, <coughs> may my breath be deep. So I switch my attention to my belly. And then I gave an intention. May my breath be deep. So now I'm in control. Rather than what's going on in my, my brain, where it wants to go, where it wants to go. Now I'm in control. <coughs> and this is basically what mindfulness is. If we have that ongoing issue, whenever I meet Bill, I always get upset. <coughs> That's where we do the reflection. 
That's for future anxiety that we might be experiencing. This is probably maybe 5% of our work. This is maybe 10 or 15, but this is 80%. It's learning to pay attention in a very safe and caring way. So today we're starting at, um, at two plus, and before break we're going to look at mindfulness and anxiety, and then after break we're going to look at listening and core values. Those are going to be helpful for the grounding that we just did, that was physical grounding, but what about emotional grounding? How do we ground ourselves emotionally? That's where the core values come in. When I have a sense that this is Ross, I know this about Ross. This is what Ross values. That gives me a place to come home to. So that kind of acts as a beacon. My friend Gary did a lot of sailing. And so I like to use some of, some of the sailing um, metaphors and whatnot. So that can be like an anchor. Our values can be our anchor. You know, when life is, is rough and turbulent and whatnot, it's like, holy cow, where do I, where do I go? What, what, are my, what are my values? When we've already reflected and we know that the core, this is my core value, that's our homecoming. Yeah, this really stinks, but this is, this is where, our, where I feel safe and, and secure. So those are the two, two. One is for grounding just to release anxiety physically, emotionally, in the present moment, but the other one is for, for down the road, and also in the present moment. Can you give an example of what a value is? Because sometimes... Yeah, if in, your, in your notes. It's in the notes, okay. Yeah, if you, you go in your... give an example of a value you may have, or? Yeah, integrity is, is uh, a big one for me. I'm, if you like, it, it's been recommended that I share some of my story. And so uh, when I was putting together this workshop, I started looking back over my, my life, and I really saw how important values were, and how, they've been, how they have been guiding me. I didn't really think about it so much, but it's because with Self-Help Alliance, I looked at their mission statement. Their mission statement is to have value, that we're all of value. So that's huge. So it's when I feel valued, when I feel connected, things are different. So anyway, I'll be, I'll be showing some of that later, but if, uh, just in the interest of time. <coughs> so integrity was, was, uh, was mine. I started at 25, I wanted to become a better person. You know, I was married, had a little baby, and uh, you know, like, uh, I wanted to become a better person. So I started out of my, you know, packed up my bag of whatever, <laughs> and I started, you know, started on that journey, and it's been, it's been a beautiful journey. It's been tough, uh, and I'm really, really still on it. But yeah, it really started, yeah, I would say intentionality, spirituality started for me at 20, 24, 25. Any more questions? Okay, this is the Guelph uh, Self-Help Alliance. Uh, the mission is Self-Help Alliance mission is to be guided by its recovery values, principles and become recognized as leaders in the mental health and addiction recovery, peer support and self-help. <coughs> this is the one that I was just mentioning, the vision, a vision of a society in which people are valued, where people are of value. They're honored for their uniqueness. So what I've done is I've taken that value <coughs> piece and that will be the second half of the workshop for us. Uh, just from kind of in simplicity, value, <coughs> honored, and uniqueness. Um, value means to be a valuable, uh, of, oops, I got to correct that slide. <laughs> uh, honored is to be respected. And uniqueness is that we're all unique. But a lot of this, I think, is a two-way street. So if I walk into a certain situation, that situation I may not be respected. But I think there's something that happens if I have that inner respect. I think 
there's a different dimension that happens. So the more that I value myself and I respect myself, I think at a different level that gets conveyed. So in some ways, the work really begins here. And that's where the beauty of mindfulness comes in. We learn to stop, have those quiet times, come into presence, and then when we're safe and grounded, then we can invite some of that anxiety to come up. You know, what is it that you need? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, quiet time, we already did the, the first quiet time. We'll have a bunch of them today. Uh, exercises, we've got exercises for mindful listening, connecting, and core values. This is an important slide for me in that if I just stand up here all, all afternoon and talk, the best case scenario is, is um, there might be about 8% of what I say that gets conveyed. But if you get involved with me, do the exercises, become interested, there's a chance that you'll walk away with over 80% retention. Your time's valuable. So that's the encouragement. And that's why I've, I've introduced these quiet times. We can talk about it a lot, but unless we actually experience it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stick so well. Okay, uh, this is kind of my slogan, uh, yes we can, and uh, that's what I feel right here with what Self-Help Alliance is doing. It's like we're not in this alone. It's like yes we can, we're all in this room together, so we're not alone. I'm here to support you, you're here, you're supporting me by coming. And so there's a different feeling about that, it's just yes we can. And I'll explain more about that later. And again as it says here, everything is optional. It has to be comfortable and right for you. Uh, guidelines, you can't do it wrong. Um, disclaimer, um, uh, in order to not get too wordy, things have been generalized in some ways. Uh, and all the material here is for educational. It's not to consider that this takes the place of professional um, advice or treatment. And my goal today is to support you. And I want the material I give you to be practical. And I want it to be fun. I want it to be enjoyable. The mind likes it when, it's, when there's some fun, when there's some energy there. You know, it's a different energy. So quiet time. We're going to have another quiet time. And this time you can just, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a suggestion, but quiet time is basically is first becoming aware of the sounds in the room. And then shifting your attention into your body, into a safe place in your body. So may I be interested in the sounds in the room? That's an intention. Gives the mind something to do. May I feel the sensations of my posture. Again, that's an intention that helps guide the mind. All the other stuff will be there to deal with later, but right now it's nice to give the mind a little bit of a break. It only has to be interested in sounds and sensations. <coughs> May I feel my feet? May I curl my toes? May I feel my hands? May I feel my tongue? So this is the practice of grounding. This is it. 
It's just the practice of stopping the overthinking and dropping the attention into the body, into the posture, into those grounded, safe sensations. No place to go. No thing to do. Nobody to please. Just stopping and dropping, coming back home. And when you sigh, that's a sign of release. That indicates that stress is being released from your body. Anxiety is being released. So you can encourage sighs and yawns. Those are all wonderful indicators that the body is starting to come back into balance. Okay, we'll conclude that exercise now. And so stopping and dropping, that was a grounding practice of being briefly in the present moment. Any questions about this? It's not a question per se, but a comment. And I find when I stop and I close my eyes and I think about breathing, I feel more panicked. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so the comment is that whenever the shift is from being grounded to the belly, that there's panic, sensations of, of panic and anxiety. That's perfect. Perfect question. <laughs> that's why we always start with grounding. This is, this is our emotional area, the throat the chest, and the tummy. So we avoid that. In, in this case, what I would do is I would just avoid it. Over time, as we know that we can go to the posture of our body, to those grounding safe sensations, this will start to subside. So we never want to force the mind. The mind's a beautiful thing, but we don't want to force it. So we don't, you know, if, if we're feeling, noticing our breath is getting short and tight, we just, okay, Let's, let's, go, let's go to a different location and avoid this. But just recognize that there is some information here for us probably. There's probably something here that it, it would like us to, to become aware of. But we can't work with that. We can't reflect on that until we're first grounded. So it's always grounded. We have nothing more to take away from here. It's just that ability to stand and be grounded or sit and be grounded. That's it. We've had a really good workshop if, if, that's, if that's what we walk away with. May I offer something? Um, one of the things that Ross wrote down there in one of the slides, which I think is really important, is that it's optional. And each one of us is the one who lives in this body. And when we do something that may be anxiety producing, we can always open our eyes and shift the awareness so that we don't increase that. I don't think I introduced Gary. Hmm. <laughs> 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 uh, Gary and Susan, can I? Uh, these are two good friends of mine and we are part of a meditation group that's been going now for about 26 years. So anyway, it's wonderful to, to have, have you here. And um, Gary works um, a lot with folks um, with, with different challenges in that way. He does a lot of volunteer work. <coughs> Susan's a longtime meditator and yoga practitioner and, and also supports a lot of, a lot of folks. So thank you for coming. So mindfulness, it's not a big deal. There's nothing to get right, because when we get right, then we're getting uptight. You know, we just stop and drop it back home. Let it go. I'll figure this out some other time, you know. Uh, it's, it's not that important. So uh, we'll get on to the next.
slide here. So this will be my story, and um, so our our theme today is grounding and reflecting. Uh, so these are going to be some of the things about where I live, my education, kind of family and career. But the big part is the challenges that I faced in my life and what I've learned from them. Those those challenges. So uh, we were first settlers. This is the original log cabin. That, uh, that my grandmother was born in. Uh, yeah, my, the story goes that my great-great-grandfather was the first person to carry in a cross-cut saw. It was all, you know, the, the, it was just Indian trails. And my grandma told me stories when she was a little girl, she would stand at this door and the, there was a beaver meadow across the road. I guess back in those days it wasn't across the road, but um, the Indians really liked apples and, and there was apple trees. There's still some old apple trees on this property. And so her mother would make apples and they would barter with the Indians for baskets. And she said that an Indian would come and he would eat the whole pie right there. <laughs> My grandmother would be looking up at him. We just couldn't get over this, you know. <laughs> so um, that's my grandmother and this is my cousin. Uh, this is my, my father. My father died when I was 13. And my mother married the best man. So this is my stepfather. And uh, I, like I knew him all my life. He was, uh, he was you know, he was a great, uh, great, wonderful uh, person. Uh, so anyway, I don't want to bore you with this stuff. Um, I was born on a farm, I was an only boy. Uh, and there's 12 girls back the side road, so I got bullied a lot. And um, I had the same teacher for, for uh, eight years. Um, so when I, oh, here's a picture of my mom. And we lived, uh, I lived up, the farm was up by Own Sound, and my mother came from the Thornberry, Meaford area. Well, that's a picture of me. Uh, seven months. Life was good. <laughs> My mom said the day that she took me for this photo, she said it must have been one of the hottest days of the year. We never had a car. So what she had to do was walk out to the highway and hitchhike and take me to Meaford, hoping that I wouldn't be all sweaty and out of sorts sort of thing to get this picture taken. And this is my cousin. Um, they lived in Toronto. So that's me and my, my pet dog. Um, so anyway, I used to come to Kitchener area. Um, we, I was raised on um, family allowance, social assistance. We never had a car. And um, the disease that my dad had uh, eventually took his life. Um, you know, that was really difficult. It was just mom and I on the farm. We didn't have, didn't have any brothers and sisters. So what I used to do is I would come to Kitchener and save up my money and go back to school for the, for the winter sort of thing. And then um, when I graduated, I just went right to, right to uh, Kitchener. <coughs> and in 1968, I met my wife, Bridget. Uh, we just celebrated on May, we met May 24th weekend. <laughs> so 48 years ago, no. we met at Salvo Beach. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really something. Um, so then, um, in 1971, we got married. I served an apprenticeship in air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, and and our daughter was born in '76, Heidi, and our son was born in '80. I injured my back in 82, and uh, William Roberts wanted me to go back and start up a, a division for them, so I went back there, and I started up two other departments for them when I was there. Okay. Oh, I got the wrong view here. <coughs>
Ah, that's better. In 1990, my wife got cancer for the third time. And that's really started to, to really, things shifted for me in my life. I was 40 years old. Um, you know, I, I just had a lot, lot on my plate. And uh, so we had, you know, my wife was spending quite a bit of time with her parents too because they were, they had different diseases. Um, there was a turn down in the economy in uh, 93. I lost my support staff and so I was wearing suits one day. I'd be wearing, you know, coveralls another day, that sort of thing. I was given a lot more responsibility, but I didn't have, have the support. So what happened was my health just started to go down, 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 down. By the time uh, 95 rolled around, I was driving home one night after work and my eyes went shut. As soon as I turned down our side road, my eyes went shut. And it took all my effort just to try to open my eyes. And they just shut again. And they did that three times. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, he said, I've only ever seen this once before. He says, but you're gonna have to resign. I love my job. I really did. And so that was huge. So, um, you know, I was losing my parents. My parents, my mom had Alzheimer's. Stepfather had um, cancer and degenerative heart failure. Bridges' parents both had cancers. You know, things were really, really, really hard. Really, really hard. And uh, so I, I resigned. And, um, oh, okay, that's basically my country school, where I went to school. And, oh, this picture I should. This is me, I'm probably about, I don't know, 14 or 15. This is Bridget about 17, and this is me about 18. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me go back here. Um, so what happened? My health continued to uh, deteriorate. And probably the anger and the anxiety and the depression, it probably started back in 1990. So, and it just kept building year after year after year after year after year. So even when I changed my job, I still had all the other issues to deal with in my life. So that's when <clears throat> I thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something here. There's a, some, I don't know, it wasn't a voice, but there was just a feeling that there's something I can do about this. <coughs> Didn't know what it was. So then I started doing yoga. Uh, my body was in terrible, terrible shape. So I started doing yoga and it, it, be, it was, I knew that that was helping. Um, and the yoga teacher said, there's going to be a meditation retreat up at Ignatius College. So I went there that weekend and I went on this meditation retreat. And I sat there, you know, I'm sitting there on Saturday and the teacher's giving the instructions and she says, just notice whatever <coughs> comes up. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Just notice whatever comes up. Just acknowledge it. Okay, yeah, I can do that. And wow, I could, I could feel the difference. And so Sunday, I went back, and then the mind started getting involved. It's got to be more complicated than this. It's got to be more to it than that, Ross. You know, it just can't be just sitting there, just becoming aware of, of what's coming up. Because when you sit in a meditation posture, you're grounded. You're grounded, you have your legs crossed usually, and you're grounded. So the posture itself grounds you and helps to keep you safe. So then you can more easily just watch what comes up, watch what comes up, <coughs> if the mind doesn't start getting you know, tricky. So what happened was, for about six weeks after that, my energy was, was restored. So I knew that meditation, mindful meditation, worked. There was, because I was taking Prozac and Zoloft and a whole bunch of different drugs and going to counselors and you know, like I, I was just really in bad shape. And some of these drugs just weren't working. But this just going and sitting made all that difference. There's something here. So um, then I went to, that was in 97 or so, 